Circumcision is the cutting of the flesh. But what is it meant to signify? What is it? What does it entail? Is it just some sort of random exercise or ritual that he's supposed to partake in? Well, actually, no. Circumcision was, was not uncommon. It was not unique to Israel. It was something that was known and practiced elsewhere, typically for clean, cleanliness purposes. But it also takes on significance in the Old Testament as God has appropriated it as a sign and seal of his covenant. In Exodus 4, 18 26, through 26, God has just called Moses to go deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. And yet he shows up to either kill him or his children because they haven't practiced circumcision. Exodus 6, 12 through 30, 12 and 30, it was used by Moses to refer to his lack of eloquence in speech. I am a man of uncircumcised lips. In Leviticus 26, 41, there's punishment for sin. Uncircumcised hearts need to be humbled. In Deuteronomy 10, 16, he says, circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, the Lord will circumcise their hearts. Of course, in Joshua 5, there's um, the circumcision as they enter into the promised land. The, it's the last thing you want to do when you're showing up to fight or conquer people is to cross the land. We're here to conquer you, but hold on, we're going to do circumcision first and make all the fighting males laid up for a while. It's the worst battle plan ever, but the victory in the battle belongs to the Lord. It's the faithfulness that truly matters, and the battle belongs to the Lord. Jeremiah 4.4 4 says, Take away the foreskin of your hearts, men of Judah. Jeremiah 6.10, Uncircumcised ears are a failure to listen, those who do not delight in the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 9.25 and 26, They are circumcised, but they're not circumcised of their heart. The circumcision of the flesh did not accomplish anything if the heart was not transformed. And then Ezekiel 44, 7, people coming into the temple without circumcision of heart or flesh. Well, since circumcision relates to the taking away of uncleanness and deals with procreation as it was given prior to the birth of Isaac, it indicates that the fleshly efforts to accomplish God's purposes must be done away with. It's the promise of God, not the fleshly efforts. And this was something that Abraham had to learn. You remember in Genesis chapter 16? God had given him a promise, but he kept waiting. And he kept waiting. And he kept waiting. And Sarah comes up with this plan. You can take Hagar, and we'll have a seed through Hagar. We'll have a child through Hagar. She can be my child, and then everything will be solved. Well, they do this, and they have Ishmael. And even in Genesis 17, Abram says to God, may Ishmael live before you. He can't sort of believe that God can still do this in some sort of way. There's some sort of doubt. May Ishmael live before you. Remember earlier it was Eleazar, now it's Ishmael. God, we had this plan in Genesis 16, it's recorded there. We had this plan, now I have a son, and it's Ishmael. May he live before you. No, it's not Ishmael. Sarah's going to have a child. It's through him that my promise will go forth. You see, the fleshly efforts to bring about or accomplish, God, accomplish God's purposes must be done away with. For it is God alone who will achieve, achieve His purposes. Now, this is highlighted, of course, in Galatians 4, uh, 21 through 31, as an illustration of the importance of the child born from above, not the child of fleshly efforts, contrasting Sinai with Abraham, or Isaac as the child of promise, and Ishmael the child of the flesh. Well, the circumcision points to that. Every time he and his wife were together after that, it'd be a reminder. It's not the flesh. It's the promise. So circumcision then, if we look at it from this perspective, circumcision is, is not just a sign. It is a sign and seal of the actual work of God, a work that only can be accomplished by God. <laughs> circumcision of the heart is something that only God can do. Deuteronomy 10.16, 10, 10, Deuteronomy 36. Jeremiah 4.4, 4, Ezekiel 44.7 through 9. Voss concludes, circumcision teaches that physical descent from Abraham is not sufficient to make true Israelites. The uncleanness and disqualification of nature must be taken away. Dogmatically speaking, therefore, circumcision stands for justification and regeneration plus sanctification. In other words, the outward sign was meant to be an inward reality of what God was doing. 
Well, that finally brings us to Genesis chapter 22. Isaac has finally been born. And God appears to, to Abram, Abraham at this point. Thankfully, we can get to this point now where I can just call him Abraham. It's a bit going back and forth. Um, and he's told to take his son, the son of, the, son of, his, of the promise, his only uh, son, his beloved son, and take him up on the mountain that God would show him and offer up Isaac on the altar. And you'll remember that James treats, James chapter 2, treats this act, this act by Abraham as evidence of true faith. It's evidence that he truly believed. He believed and he acted accordingly. Well, when we look at this passage, there are many things that we ask. First, there's the moral problem. Isn't it wrong to sacrifice humans? Well, even Deuteronomy forbids the sacrifice of humans. Now, Voss, Voss warns us that the Bible does not technically forbid human sacrifice. It's the imperfect human sacrifice that must be forbidden. Uh, he argues this on the basis of the atonement, that Christ took on flesh and he was sacrificed for our sin. But all other human sacrifice is, of course, forbidden. But what does the... Um, but what does this point us forward to? Well, there's a few hints in the passage as we keep going. But I just want to just sort of leave that there. There's the moral question, the moral problem. That's what most people focus on. But there's also a promise problem. God had very specifically said, Isaac is the one through whom I will bless all the families of the earth. And Isaac doesn't have any children. And if, if Abram kills, Abraham kills Isaac, then how is God going to accomplish his, part, uh, his purposes? How is he going to fulfill his word? So you have a promise problem. It's going to be Isaac, not Ishmael. Go up on the mountain and sacrifice Isaac. Well, I think there are two key hints of what's going on in the passage. First, in verse 5, it says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, some people take this to be uh, an indication that he was just lying. I'm going to go over there. You stay here. I'm lying to you and I'm going to go sacrifice my son. Uh, but interpreted against the New Testament, I think there's something more significant going on there. The other key uh, to what is actually taking place here is verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. You remember Isaac is, is carrying the wood up, and he's asked, he's, he seems so meek at this point, uh, Father, where is the sacrifice? He's worshipped with his father before. Where's the lamb? He knows what it means to go offer a sacrifice with his dad. It's sort of like if you took your children hunting or fishing, they know what's supposed to be going on. Where is it? Where is the lamb? God will provide a sacrifice for himself. That's another key hint to what's taking place in the passage. And as you remember, it's, he lays him down, he straps him down. You don't even get a sense that there's a struggle. Isaac is laid on the wood, he's tied down, and the knife goes back, and just as he's about to sacrifice his son, an angel speaks. Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for, I, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So the Lord provides for himself. Well, with this basic context in view, and I want to talk a little bit more about what's going on in the passage, but with this basic context of these key passages, I want to talk now about the grammar of the gospel according to Abraham. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 4. Romans 4. The grammar of the gospel according to Abraham. Paul writes, when, what, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his, agent, his, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, by faith, uh, his faith is counted 
as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. Now remember that's quoted back to 15.6 in Genesis. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. In other words, Paul is saying that the gospel is in the fact that Genesis 15 precedes Genesis 17. Genesis 15, justification by faith alone. Genesis 17, the response to the sign and seal of that faith, that justification by faith alone. And by Abraham, who believed in God and was counted to him as righteousness, by Abraham, this believer being justified prior to circumcision, he is the father of all those who believe and who are not circumcised. But he is also the father, he receives circumcision, he is also the father of all who are circumcised, but walk according to his ways, who walk in his footsteps, that is, our faith. In other words, anyone who has ever been saved has been saved by faith in Jesus Christ. The seed of Abraham, the promised seed of Abraham, through whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. The blessing precedes the condition. If 17 precedes 15, then the condition would be before the blessing. And you have no hope. But 15 precedes 17. The blessing precedes the condition. And the condition is fruit that God is producing. It's the gospel grammar of the gospel of Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant was unilateral in its accomplishment. God said, I will take all of the curses upon myself to achieve this. But it had a bilateral destination. God was producing something in Abraham. You see, Abraham was circumcised not just of the flesh, he was circumcised of the heart. And that is something that only God can do. Well, what about the faith of Abraham? If he's the father of the faith, then what did he believe about God? That's a big question I get asked that all the time in, 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 in seminary. What, what did they actually believe? What did they actually know? And I think sometimes they believe a lot more, knew a lot more than we think. But Abraham, the New Testament points to something very specific about the faith of Abraham. And it's that his faith he knew something about the resurrecting power of God. The resurrecting power of God in the seed of the promise. Let's keep reading in Romans 4, verse 13 and following. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be his heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise, promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Remember, who's the father? To all his offspring. This is to, to, um, to Abraham. And already Paul has narrowed the offspring of, of Abraham to those who believe, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. That is key. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. In other words, 
it's very reasonable for him to look at how old he was physically and how old his wife was and to realize that they were as good as dead. And yet he believed God, that God could bring life out of death, something out of nothing. It's the creative resurrecting power of God. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be, it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. In other words, he's saying that that the, the faith that was counted to him as righteousness is akin to, similar to, your faith in the resurrected power of God. God took Sarah's wound, which was as good as dead, and his own body, which was as good as dead, and he calls life to come forth. That is the power of God. Well, also, we see this resurrecting faith, this power of God in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 11, and 12. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, catch that language again, as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as, innumerable, and, and as many as the innumerable grains of the sands by the seashore. And then again in 17 through 19, by faith, Abraham when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac, shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking he did receive him back. The boy and I will come back. It's been said in rabbinical teaching that what happened to Israel happened to Abraham first. Already we've talked about how he goes down to Egypt and he has an exodus. God afflicts Pharaoh's household and he afflicts, uh, afflicts, afflicts Pharaoh's household and Abraham plunders the Egyptians and is called forth. Well, just as God passed over the firstborn of Israel in Egypt too by the sacrifice of the lamb, Isaac the son of the promise, his beloved son is passed over in Genesis chapter 22. Ram's sacrifice in its place. You see, on display in Abraham's life is God's power to create life, to give life. There is Isaac, the son of the promise. He shouldn't be there. God had done something miraculous. But also there is shown the need for atonement, the need for substitution, the need for sacrifice. Well, another son would carry wood up to a place where another father would offer up his son. The voice of the angel would not make it stop this time. If the son had cried out, a multitude of angels would have come and made it stop. He had walked on water. He had cast out demons. Raised the dead to life. Those nails could have pulled him. Now the great agony that pinned him to the cross was his deep and abiding love for you. A love that would bear before a God who was of pure eyes than to look upon sin, that bit of gossip you told late last night. A love that bore the pornography you saw the other day. A love that bore the white lie you told, your blasphemy, your disrespect for your parents, your jealousy, your pride, your envy, your greed. He accepted the Father's consuming wrath, silent like a lamb, like a sheep before its shears. He did not lift up his voice to make it stop. No rams would be offered. The knife would not be held back. The great agony of the cross was not the asphyxiation. It was not the nails. It was not the shame of being hung up naked or the crown of thorns. It was not being mocked. The great agony of the cross was your sin. It was my sin, causing him to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Underneath the hell of the crushing weight of God's wrath. But death 
could not hold him. And just as Abraham believed that God could bring life out of death, Jesus rose from the dead. You see, that's the gospel, according to Abraham. It's substitutionary atonement. It is justification by faith alone. It is abide in me and you will bear fruit. It is in Abraham all the families of the earth will be blessed. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons and one God we list to declare your glory. Our minds are too feeble to even scratch the surface of your infinite beauty. You are the thrice holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We confess that although we know you, we only know you in part. Surely your goodness is matchless. Your wonders to me to account. Your glory too great to define. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? In you there is no shadow of change. You are of purer eyes than to look upon sin, and yet you sent, sent your son to say to sinners, This is my blood which is shed for you. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, you delivered your people from bondage in Egypt. But as a meek and mild Savior with outstretched arms on the cross, you delivered people from every people, nation, tongue, and tribe. We marvel that you were pleased to experience weakness, suffer reproach for our sake. By your wounds, we have been healed. You died, we might live. You left glory that you might bring us to all, to glory for all eternity. O oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name on the earth. And we pray that you would help us, in light of your goodness and your glory, to walk in the footsteps of Abraham, who believed God, who was counted as righteous in your sight, and who lived a life or sought to live a life and by your grace live the life worthy of the calling that you received. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, next time we're going to talk about the Mosaic Covenant and, um, and also be thinking about the love of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll pick back up tomorrow morning.